Glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are talking about finding grace, and we are in the book of Genesis, chapter 40. We start at verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And so you have here two individuals, the butler of the king of Egypt on the one hand and the baker on the other. Now, spiritually, you could look at this as two possible analogies. For instance, you could consider that on the one hand, you would have the saved and on the other, the unsaved. That would be the seed of the Lord and the seed of the serpent the saved versus the unsaved. These could be two groups of people that we would be looking at here, or you can look at it in a prophetic manner and seeing it as Israel on the one hand, the chosen people, and the barbarians, that is the nations or the Gentiles on the other hand. So saved versus unsaved or Israel versus the nations, the Gentiles, whichever way we look at this, we can look at it and consider that the butlers are representing different groups on the earth. I read again, Genesis chapter 40, verse one. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. Here we have the spiritual image of God almighty against whom we have all committed an offense. You see, for instance, if we use the image of having the two butlers represent on the one hand Israel and on the other the nations, when we speak about Israel, let us go to Amos chapter three, verse one. Hear this word that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And so you saw that Israel had been warned that they were the chosen people whom the Lord had secoured out of Egypt and that they were the ones known of all the families of the earth. And so from that perspective, you can look at it as Israel versus the nations, the Gentiles. And further, they're being reproved because they have sinned. And so Israel hath sinned against the Lord. And also, brothers and sisters, if we look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, remember how the Apostle Paul had made a difference between the Jews and the nations, the Gentiles. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, this is when Paul was rebuking Peter because he was not behaving properly and was being a hypocrite in his demeanor separating himself from the Gentiles when he feared the circumcision. And so again, Galatians chapter two, verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. So again, you see that difference that is made in terms of Israel, the image of the Jews and the Gentiles, the image of the nations. But ultimately, let us remember that the Lord told us in his word that whether a man be a Jew or a Gentile, he is likewise a sinner because there is not one righteous, no, not one. And both Jews and Gentiles are guilty before God. We go to the book of Romans chapter three, starting at verse nine. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so the Jew is not better than the Gentile. They are both sinners before God. And so getting back to the top, Genesis chapter 40, verse 1, and it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. The king of Egypt, in the image of the Lord, has been offended 
by two groups of individuals, and we have discussed the possibility that these individuals could represent the saved versus the unsaved, or Israel, the Jews, versus the nations, the Gentiles. And we have seen that in any case, whether it be about being a Jew or a Gentile, all have come up short of the glory of God, and before him all are sinners, none are justified. And we also know from Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And so therefore, this applies to every human being. And so where we get away from Israel versus the Gentiles, the Jews versus the nations, if we go back to saying we are considering the saved versus the unsaved, we have to understand that both they that are saved and unsaved were shapen in iniquity, and that it is only at the time of conversion that the saved, being drawn in by God, will convert and walk in righteousness thereafter. But being conceived in sin, it turns out that all are sinners, whether they are saved or unsaved, in the beginning when they come into this world. And so both butlers have committed an offense. Notice the Bible doesn't tell us in which way they offended, but we know for a fact that they did. In other words, all human beings, in whatsoever way they have offended the Lord, in the image of the king of Egypt, they have offended him. Whether it be this way or that way, we ultimately are all sinners and none is righteous. And this is an aspect we can speak about later when we speak about finding grace. The Lord is able to forgive us our offense, whatsoever it may be. And so whether it be Israel versus the nations, the Jews versus the Gentiles, or it be the saved versus the unsaved, we have all committed offense against the Lord, and there is none righteous, no, not one. We just spoke about the prophet Amos and how he warned Israel and how Israel was reproved because of their iniquity. We now go to Nehemiah chapter one, verse six. Let us read. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. This is such a beautiful verse. To see the heart of Nehemiah, who was grieving for his people, who were left of the captivity in Jerusalem. And as we know, Nehemiah was going to be sent by God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he was grieving for these people who at that time, they were currently suffering and the city was not yet rebuilt. But listen to his repentance. I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Do you see these last eight words? Very simple words, but we seldom get ourselves to speak them. Both I, first pointing the finger at himself, and my father's house, my family, we have sinned. And this is a reminder that we must humble ourselves before the Lord Almighty. We must humble ourselves and recognize that there is none righteous and that it is by grace through faith that we are saved. And therefore, this is a beautiful act of repentance by Nehemiah on top of him interceding for his own. Because indeed, brothers and sisters, in order to have communion with the Lord, we want to stay in the light because he is light and there is no darkness in him. But if we sin, we walk in darkness. 
and we do not want to sin against him. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And so each of us, we must come to a point where we fear sinning against the Lord as Israel did. And Nehemiah offered repentance on that occasion that we just read about before he was sent to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and was grieving for his people. And he was a cup bearer. And the king, Artaxerxes, noticed that Nehemiah's countenance was sad because Nehemiah was being afflicted by this situation in his heart. And so there is a concern not to sin against the Lord. Why? Because we know that the Lord told us in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And so when we want to keep the commandments, we don't want to be in a position where we sin against the Lord and create a separation between him and ourselves. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Likewise, still in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 31, Yeshua, Jesus, reminds us, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And therefore do we understand the concern that we must have that we sin not against the Lord, against God. And so we saw Nehemiah's repentance concerning his people, his father's house, and himself. Now let us also look at another great repentance that Ezra spoke concerning his people. We are in the book of Ezra, chapter 9, verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. Verse 6, and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Oh, magnificent words, Lord Yeshua Mashiach. Hallelujah. Verse 7, since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. Confession, wreck recognizing with humility what you have done wrong. Let's read verse 7 again. Since the days of our fathers have we been, he includes himself in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. You acknowledge God's correction. You accept it. You acknowledge that you were wrong, and that being weak, God came to your rescue, and have sinned before him, being a sinner, because there is not one righteous, no, not one. And a humble and contrite heart is what God is looking for. Another beautiful repentance here being expressed by Ezra. And now for a little space, grace hath been shewed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. And so you see here grace being shown by the Lord to his people. And there is a remnant that he is taking out of a tribulation. That our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Let's focus on the bondage now. Verse 9, for we were a bondman, 
Yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy, grace, unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And so you see here, Ezra touches on the aspect of being bondman. Because there is none one righteous, no, not one. It means that all being born in iniquity from their mother's womb, whether they be saved or unsaved, whether they be Israel or part of the Gentiles, the nations, all being born in iniquity, according to Psalm 51, 5, they are born in bondage to sin. And those who will be saved, that is the case until the day of their conversion. And so humankind is in bondage to sin. That's why they needed a savior to set them free, to no longer be captives. And so by way of the iniquities that were committed, on the one hand by Israel, but on the other by Gentiles also, mankind is in bondage to sin because sin, which leads to death, sin has dominion over mankind. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 19, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. And this is the part that interests me here. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. When you are overcome by something, you become a slave to it. You become a servant to it. And therefore, you become in bondage to it. And so at the fall of man, our corrupt nature, our flesh, our fallen state in the flesh, in the sinful flesh that we have, it brought us to a place where we were now in bondage to sin, which leads to death. Because Adam and Eve were overcome by sin, and thus the bondage. And so getting back to the book of Ezra chapter 9, we read at verse 7, Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And so because of the iniquities, the people were delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands. In other words, there was punishment because they had set themselves slaves to sin. They were in bondage. This is why in verse 8, at the end of it, Nehemiah speaks about bondage. And as well in the beginning of verse 9. Verse 8, and now for a little space, grace hath been shewed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Verse 9, for we were bondmen. And so the spiritual image here is that they were bondmen in the flesh, but in the sin they were also in bondage to sin, being slaves to sin because of their iniquities. Yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And so I've been using this physical image of bondage where the people had been in captivity to show you spiritually that concerning sin, which leads to death, they also had been in bondage by way of committing offenses against God, by way of their iniquity and having sinned against the Lord, which is the case whether you are Israel rather than the Gentiles, the nations, 
and which is also the case whether you be the saved versus the unsaved. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God, and all are born in iniquity from their mother's womb. And therefore, what I am saying in connection to the main train of thought concerning Genesis chapter 40 is that we have all committed an offense in the same manner as both butlers that were serving the king. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. We once were in bondage to sin, all of us. Now we further know from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. And therefore, being in bondage to sin and serving sin, we cannot at the same time be serving the Lord, which is why we are sinning against him and are in iniquity. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. For let us not forget, brothers and sisters, that we are bought with a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Verse 23, ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. And so we have liberty and freedom in Christ, sure. But once we are free in Christ, we actually are his servants. But the good news is that when you are a servant to Christ, you are serving him. And you are his servant as opposed to being a servant of sin, as opposed to being in bondage to sin. And this by the grace of our Lord. Let us look at how Paul makes mention of this, that we become slaves of Christ. Philemon, verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And so having liberty in Christ is actually being a prisoner of Jesus Christ, because you are now going to do his will as he liveth in you. And Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Still in Philemon, verse 9, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, and thereby do you see, brothers and sisters, that indeed we are going to serve either one master or the other. And so Paul makes it clear that in his case, being in bondage, he is servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly not in bondage to the things of this world, certainly not in bondage to sin, which was the case when the people of Israel and Judah rebelled against the Lord and against his commandments. And this is why some of the prophets repented for their nations. We saw the example of Nehemiah and Ezra, both of them making beautiful confessions, beautiful acts of repentance, where they acknowledged their sin and the sin of their nation, of their forefathers, and humbled themselves before God. We have sinned against thee, seeing in the book of Psalm that we want to make an effort to keep the law of the Lord close to our heart that we sin not against him. Why? Because the Lord said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And this in turn connects to the fact that we are Christ's servants. Though we are set free from the bondage of sin, we become slaves again, but to Christ. And this by his grace through faith. We are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of man. And so therefore, when we are set free from the captivity of sin, 
we are no more overcome by sin and no more in bondage to sin. We had talked about this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. We are talking about finding grace. We are talking about Genesis chapter 40, the story of the two butlers who had committed an offense about Pharaoh the king. We are talking about finding grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so being his workmanship, we are at his service. And this touches on the aspect that we have just expounded on by saying that as slaves, we are enslaved to Christ, to Jesus Christ, becoming his prisoners akin to Paul. We are no longer in bondage to sin because we have found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and it is a gift. And so we have found grace as Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, though he was upright, still committed sin in his life. We know that Jesus Christ is the only one, Yeshua HaMashiach, who did no sin. So Noah committed sin, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he was saved from the flood alongside members of his family, eight in total. We are talking about finding grace. Alleluia. So brothers and sisters, so that we may set things in order, we go back to the top. We are in Genesis chapter 40. We are talking about finding grace because all of us have been found to be sinners and that there is none righteous before God. And whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be saved or unsaved, from our mother's womb, we were born and shapen in iniquity. And so we read at verse 1, And it came to pass after these things, that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. We have spoken about spiritual images, about the two butlers representing on the one hand Israel versus the nations, the Gentiles, or on the other, representing the saved versus the unsaved. But in any case, there has been an offense. All have offended the Lord, the King of Egypt, in the image of the Almighty God. And so all humans, all men before God are guilty. And further, we were reminded of the importance of acknowledging our sin, being humble before the Lord, and being able to confess our sin and repent the way that Nehemiah and Ezra did as examples where they confessed their iniquity before the Lord. And we remember that we must keep the word close to our heart that we sin not against the Lord. Verse two, and Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And so God does not acquit the wicked. And we have the image here of a king willing to lay down a sanction upon transgressors. Here, the chief of the butlers and the chief of the bakers. Remember the master-servant relationship? Let us go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, for a moment. Luke, chapter 16, verse 1. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Verse 2, And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. 
And so here you see the master-servant relationship where an account is going to be demanded and the servant must demonstrate to his master that he is serving well. Give an account of thy stewardship for thou mayest be no longer steward. In the book of Nahum chapter one, verse three, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. And so the Lord will not acquit the wicked. And it was the case in Luke chapter 16 that this steward was going to give an account for his stewardship. And if there was a fault committed, an offense, if there was iniquity, there would be a consequence. And this is a reminder to us that we must also make sure to maintain good works before the Lord, that we ought to repent in the manner that Nehemiah and Ezra repented, confessing their sins, recognizing their iniquity, and humbling themselves before the Lord so that we can also be forgiven of the Lord because he is merciful to forgive those who abase themselves before him in humility with a contrite heart a contrite spirit. And so the master-servant relationship reminds us that we are slaves to Christ and that again, no longer in bondage to sin, we serve the Lord because it is he who is living in us from the moment that we have accepted him and that he has set us free from the captivity, the bondage of sin. In the book of Galatians chapter two, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ, but Christ liveth in me. I have liberty in Christ, but that is to become his slave, his servant. Amen. And no longer be in bondage to sin, where I can only serve one of two masters. And so I make myself a prisoner of Jesus Christ, of Yehoshua HaMashiach, in the same manner that Paul did. We are talking about finding grace. Amen. We remember that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We have read in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, servants, slaves, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And this, whether we today be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be saved or unsaved, salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, the Son of God, indwelt by the fullness of divinity, by the Spirit of God himself. Alleluia. Back at Genesis chapter 40, we were at verse 2, and Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers. We saw that God does not acquit the wicked. We saw that a master will ask that an account be given of a stewardship. Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers, and against the chief of the bakers. Verse three, and he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And so here you remember that we spoke about being in bondage to sin spiritually, which was a reason, a cause for us to be separated from the Lord and not have communion with him. These are things mentioned in Isaiah chapter 59, where the Lord tells us that it is because of iniquities that Israel has separated from the Lord. 
In the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Back at Genesis chapter 40, verse 3, and so they were put in the prison. Sin will separate you from God. It is a spiritual concept. But here we have a physical image of two men representing either Jews or Gentiles or the saved or the unsaved. In the case of the saved prior to their conversion, they're in the prison, all of them. And so all men in bondage to sin, before they get to know Christ and obtain salvation, all men are in prison in the same way that these two men are in prison. Where again, these two men may represent on the one hand, Jews and Gentiles, or on the other, the saved and the unsaved, initially all are in a prison. And we have a physical representation of this by way of the butlers being thrown in jail. And so we can see that spiritual image here. Why? Because an offense was committed against the king of Egypt, that's in the physical, but in the spiritual, an offense was committed against God by the different groups that I have mentioned to you now more than once. And so the place where Joseph was bound. Now, this is another interesting aspect. We know that we are the light of the world as saints and that we must bring the light to the nations. We must illuminate their understanding. And so Joseph was bound there though he is the one through whom there will come understanding. We will get there in a moment. And so Joseph, as we know, was betrayed by his brothers and he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and he ends up in prison. He is bound. Now we know according to the Bible that all things work unto the good of those who believe. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so Joseph was bound. He was going through his own tribulation, and that was going to work for his good, in that he was going to be at the right hand of the king of Pharaoh and rule over Egypt. But at the same time, we can still see a spiritual image whereby in his affliction in the prison, Joseph will be a blessing. Joseph will be a light in that he will bring the wisdom and understanding of the Lord and pour it into the life of the two butlers. Indeed, as we will see shortly, he will give interpretation of things that they do not understand because Joseph who is bound, who is in his own affliction, has knowledge that he receives of the Lord, being in good standing with the Lord. And so therefore, another aspect, brothers and sisters, is that Joseph is bound. He is in his own affliction, but yet being bound and in his own affliction, he still has strength in his weakness to elevate others. He still has strength in his weakness to manifest the glory of God, he still has strength in his weakness to bring light and understanding to those who are in darkness, spiritually, that is physically those who are in the prison. In other words, to the two butlers. The two butlers, again, who physically being in a prison are a spiritual representation of different kinds of people on earth who are in spiritual darkness until they receive the light, whether they be Jews or Gentiles, or if we're talking about the saved versus the unsaved, those that have yet to receive the Lord are in prison until the time of their conversion. And so all these people who are in darkness spiritually, physically are represented here by the two butlers in the physical prison, and Joseph being bound there in the physical prison is also an image spiritually of the saint who is able to bring light to those who are in darkness so that they can get enlightenment concerning the things of the Lord. And this will be the image of the interpretation of the dreams, a wisdom that Joseph has, an understanding that he has by way of the Lord that the butlers don't have. Now, you may rise up and say, 
Well, isn't Joseph also in the prison with them in the physical? Yes, but spiritually what that means is that Joseph is in trials and tribulations, being enslaved himself, but not to sin, but rather to Christ. And so it's a different type of prison. Physically, you see a prison where they all are, but they are in different types of bondage, though they be in the same physical prison. In the case of Joseph, he is in prison physically, but spiritually he is enslaved to Christ. Whereas the two butlers are in prison physically, but spiritually they're in bondage to sin. They are the image of those who have yet to find Christ, whether they be Jew or Gentiles, or unsaved. Hallelujah. And so now I'm stressing out the fact that being in his own trial, Joseph had strength to be a force and a light in the world. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Let's see how the Apostle Paul, who was himself physically in bonds, how spiritually he was able to still be a light while being afflicted in the flesh. He was a light and an encouragement to those in the faith. And so the image here is that when you are in bonds, when you are in affliction, you can still be a light to those who are looking at you, though you be afflicted yourself. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And this connects to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which we just read, all things work for the good of those who believe on the Lord. Verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And so good came out of Paul remaining steadfast in his faith while he was in bonds for cause of his faith in Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So brothers and sisters, again, we go back to the top and set things in order. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 40, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And so whether it be about one butler or the other, whether it be about one group of human beings or another, the basic fact remains that there is not one righteous, no, not one, and all have offended the Lord, the Almighty. And the consequence of that is that they are all initially servants of sin from their mother's womb, and they are in bondage to one of two masters, sin, firstly. And because God does not acquit the wicked, there is a penalty, there is separation from him because of the iniquities that we have committed. There is an offense. But if we find grace, there is an opportunity by having faith on Christ and coming to repentance in the manner of men such as Nehemiah and Ezra to obtain remission for our sins because grace is a gift and is not of works that we would have done. And so verse 2, Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers, who represent the whole world in different ways that we can divide it in categories of people. And so there is a penalty because a servant did not properly serve his master. Give an account of thy stewardship for thy mayest no longer be steward. Verse 3, And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And so Joseph was bound in his own affliction, but in his own affliction he is a slave to the Lord, Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Whereas in the same prison, you find other people in bondage, but they're in bondage to sin. The two butlers in the image of 
Jews and Gentiles in the world, and of those who are saved and unsaved, where those who are saved are in bondage until the time of their conversion. Physically, we have that image here, Joseph and the two butlers, but spiritually, we have the image of Joseph serving the Lord and the world serving the other master of the two, the devil. And that is he who hath power over death, that is power over sin. Amen. Verse 4, And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. In his affliction, within the boundaries of his service, Joseph is serving. He's serving whom? He's serving others. He served them. Does this not, brothers and sisters, remind you of our master, our example, the great Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ? Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He did not come so that people would serve him, but so that he would serve others. And so back at Genesis chapter 40, we were at verse 4. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. Although the two butlers had committed an offense against the king of Egypt, although you have sinners who are still spiritually in darkness, who have committed offenses they are the ones being ministered to by the one who is in the light in that he is in bondage to Jesus Christ, Yoshua HaMashiach, rather than to sin. And so this is the spiritual image that we have, that as saints, we have our own affliction. We go through our own tribulations. But though we experience all these things, we still have to be a light in the world and shine it unto the nations who are in darkness. They are in their own prison, and we are in our own prison. In the physical, it may seem like it is the same prison, but spiritually there is a division between where they are and where we are. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verse 26, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And as you may remember, this is about the rich man in hell who is looking at Lazarus, the poor man who was begging, and they are in different places. Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham, whereas the rich man is in hell in flames and torment. And so this is to show you that even if two individuals appear to be in a space where they are able to see one another, spiritually they may be in completely different spaces, as is the case in the Gospel of Luke chapter 16 concerning Lazarus and the rich man. But concerning Joseph and the two butlers, they are physically in the same prison when you look with your eyes seemingly, but spiritually they are in different places. Joseph is in good standing with the Almighty, and so he's in the light, whereas the two butlers who have committed an offense against the Lord in the image of the king of Egypt, these two are in spiritual darkness. Amen. And this is interesting to see that though physically you may appear to be in the same environment as someone, what is important is spiritually where are you each located and reside and have your abode i also made mention brothers and sisters about joseph being bound in his affliction but yet being a light gospel of matthew chapter 5 starting at verse 14 ye are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16, 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so I make mention of this to show you that even though Joseph is bound in his affliction, he's able to be a light unto others in the image of the two butlers. Also remember I made mention of Paul being bound just like Joseph is bound, but in their affliction and in their bonds, they're still able to strengthen others by their steadfastness. Amen. In our weakness, God is strong. Book of Acts chapter 14, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Through much tribulation, Joseph was also bound in his own affliction, but he was a servant of the Almighty. To continue in the faith, and so being bound, Paul was still able to encourage others so that they would be emboldened to continue to preach the word. And he was still able to be a light in the world, Paul. And so Joseph being bound, he also will be a light in the world. And he also will be able to deliver words of wisdom by way of the interpretation that he will make of the butler's dreams. And we are getting there. Let us go back to Genesis chapter 40, verse 3. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. Same physical environment, different spiritual realities, different spiritual places. The world is in prison in bondage to sin. We are in prison in bondage to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Verse 4, and the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. And so he served them. We are charged by the Lord to go and to show the light of the gospel unto the nations. Go and make disciples. And so in the image of Jesus Christ, Yoshua HaMashiach, Joseph was not being ministered to, but he ministered to others. Hallelujah. Verse 5. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. Verse 6, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. Verse 7, and he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? Verse 8, And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. Magnificent Lord. And so we have so much information here and so much to look at. Let's go back to verse six. Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them and behold, they were sad. He looked upon them. Does this not remind you of our example, our perfect example, Yoshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the book of Philippians chapter two, verse four. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so in a more general sense, this calls on us to have the mind of Christ and to consider other people's affairs and also to bear one another's burdens. And so here, Joseph is not indifferent to the situation in which the butlers find themselves. Back at Genesis chapter 40, verse six, and Joseph came in unto them in the morning. He came in unto them. He came to them and looked upon them 
and behold, they were sad. And when he saw their countenance, he did not stay indifferent. He asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And so he looked upon them. And the reason why, brothers and sisters, these words are significant, it is because it is a reminder to us that we be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. The Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, laid eyes on us and was not indifferent to our suffering. And likewise here, Joseph, though he is in the prison physically, spiritually serving the Lord, he is looking to minister unto others. He's looking to spread the light. He's looking to bear other people's burdens, having the mind of Christ. And when he looks upon others, he does not stay indifferent to their condition. Gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Have you noticed? When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Remember that in the case of Joseph, he looked on them, the butlers. Here, a certain priest saw him. He passed by on the other side. Verse 32, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He saw him. That is, he laid eyes on him. And what did he do? He had compassion on him. Bear ye one another's burdens, having the mind of Christ. When your brothers and sisters are going through difficult times, take a moment to write unto them words of encouragement. Because we are a body and we are able to lift one another up. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 10, For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. And so this is interesting because it speaks of a fellow helping another up. But it seems that in the world today, we see that even when a fellow comes by, he may look upon you and keep walking his way. Back in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Verse 35. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Verse 37, And he said, He that shewed mercy on him. He that was able to show the image of grace. Amen. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. Hallelujah. We are talking about finding the grace of the Lord. We are talking about mercy. Back at Genesis chapter 40, verse 6. And so you see, brothers and sisters, Joseph came in unto them. He went to them, and he looked upon them. He laid eyes on them. But contrary to the priest, contrary to the Levite, he did not lay eyes on them to then decide that he was going to remain 
indifferent and take a different path and go around them, but rather he went to them and saw that they were sad and inquired about their state and showed them love and served them, bringing light unto them. These are the spiritual images that we have here. Whereas in the gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 31, the priest saw him, he passed by on the other side. A Levite looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan saw him and he had compassion on him and went to him to do him good. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22, we go down to verse 39. We're talking about the two great commandments. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so the Good Samaritan illustrated this second great commanded by loving his neighbor as himself after he had laid eyes on him, just like Joseph laid eyes on the two butlers, just like we saints as light of the world must lay eyes on the nations and go to them to serve them and show them light and have compassion on them and not rather judge them in terms of condemning them. Alleluia. Back at Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, and they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And so here, brothers and sisters, we have the image of the nations being unable to properly assess how to solve problems in this world because they are relying on their own wisdom and not on the wisdom of the Lord. In other words, there are blind leaders using the wisdom of this world to lead the world who is also blind. And therefore the light of the saints is needed so that proper interpretation can be made, proper understanding can be had, and proper wisdom can be used in the world. But not the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God. And so Joseph is going to be acting as the light bearer, as the one who will bring understanding to the world who does not have its understanding opened by the Lord, who gives understanding and intelligence. And so this is the spiritual image that we have. When you shed light on the nations and in the nations, you give them understanding. Brothers and sisters, we are in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 27. We are talking about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We are talking about providing light and understanding to the nations in darkness. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? You see, in order to understand those scriptures, you need a proper enlightenment. You need an anointing that teaches you all things, and that allows you to understand the scriptures that the Holy Spirit inspired, and you do that by having the Holy Spirit himself teach you about scripture. Understandest thou what thou readest. You see, the light that the nations need, it is the spiritual image of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And so back in the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 30, 
realizing that the understanding you need to understand scripture is provided by the Holy Spirit, by the anointing that you have received. Verse 31, and he said, how can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him because he's looking for understanding in the same way that the butlers will go to Joseph to get interpretation, that is understanding of their dream. The captives in the prison of the world, they need the light of those who are prisoners of Christ so they can interpret things properly. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. Verse 33, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. But by reading the same words that the eunuch was reading, Philip had a different understanding because he had the revelation of the Lord. And so he was able to shed a light because he had received intelligence from the Holy Spirit to understand these words. And now he could speak it to another. You remember, brothers and sisters, how Paul explained that though he had knowledge of Scripture, it is only when he got the revelation of the Lord himself that he understood all things with clarity. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, again, grace. What was Paul doing before he received that grace? He was a murderer of saints. Verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And so when it pleased God, by his grace to call upon Paul and to reveal his son in him. He then went and preached. And this is akin to Philip sharing the light of the revelation with the Ethiopian eunuch and preaching Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, to the eunuch. Because Philip had that understanding, he had received it. And likewise, when Paul had received it, he went and preached also. And this, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, being ordained a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. And so we are back in Genesis chapter 40, verse 8. And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them, I pray you. And I was making the connection with the fact that the Ethiopian eunuch needed the understanding, the light of Philip in order to understand scripture. That Paul, who knew scripture, needed the revelation of the Son of God before he would have clarity and understand the scriptures spiritually and then be in a position to go and preach them. The same way that Philip preached to the Ethiopian eunuch about Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And this connects to our mission as lights in the world to go and preach the gospel. Gospel of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And so back at Genesis chapter 40, verse 8. Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me them, I pray you. And so we as saints have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be able to shed light on the world, we can give them understanding and share with them the wisdom of God in the same way that enlightenment was given to others by those who were in clarity, having received instruction because they knew the Lord. Verse nine, and the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, 
in my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Verse 12, And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. And so we are going to take a moment to look at the interpretation of dreams and how God gives them. We are in the book of Genesis chapter 41 for yet another example, starting at verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath shewed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he sheweth unto Pharaoh. God is showing unto Pharaoh. And so God gives the interpretation. And so we go down to verse 32. And for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Lastly, we go to the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Verse 6. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. And so there are men who are wise, but according to the wisdom of this world, according to the wisdom of Babylon, and they are going to try to interpret the dream. They're going to try to shed light on the dream. Verse 7, Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Because there is such a thing, my friends, as false light, whereas you need the true light in order to know the truth. And so these men who had the wisdom of this world were not able to understand things properly because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And that which is not true light, but the false light, cannot be the pillar of truth. They did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Verse 8, But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And so you see here, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The image that we have here, this is what will give you knowledge and the ability to give light unto the nations, unto those who are in darkness and give interpretation. And before him, I told the dream saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee and no secret troubleth thee, tell me, the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. And so we will be moving further down to verse 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. And moving down to verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my Lord, the king. And Daniel will give the interpretation. Verse 27, wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor 
if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now you may remember that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream where he saw a tree, a tall tree, but that the tree was cut down, although the base of it remained. And this was a prefiguration of Nebuchadnezzar being destituted, but then being reinstated. At 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And so the magicians and the advisors of these kings, these pagan kings, they were not able to provide interpretation for dreams. It took a man of God who would get the information from the Spirit. And therefore, this is an image for us to understand that the light that we have as saints and that we shine on the nations, they need it to properly interpret the state of things. They need it to understand and perceive that this whole world is plunged in wickedness and that a remedy is needed and that the only remedy is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord Almighty. 1 John 5, 19, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. But if truly we are lights in the world, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. If we shine our light, if we provide the interpretation of the dream, if we come with the wisdom of the Lord and not the wisdom of this world, rather, then we are able to give hope to the people that they may perceive the light of the world. Jesus Christ, Yoshua HaMashiach, who said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But then he put it unto us to continue to be lights in the world. Once he was no longer in the world. Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And nowadays, like Joseph, as lights of the world ourselves, saints, we must bring light into the world. Alleluia. Amen. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We go back to Genesis chapter 40, verse 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Verse 11, And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and shew kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. Verse 14 is very interesting. I have a different a Bible study about this specific verse called Remembrance Eternal. And you can find that Bible study on my channel. I want to focus for now on verse 13, which now touches on the issue of grace because the butler was reinstated. He found grace. The butler had committed an offense of which we do not know the nature. The butler is now reinstated and we don't know what reasons caused that he be reinstated and therefore we cannot assume or speculate 
that it is by way of any type of righteousness that he had, that he was reinstated. It may be that Pharaoh simply decided to reinstate him. Now, getting back to the role of Joseph, Joseph brought unto him a message. Joseph was unto the butler a light. And when he looked into that light, the butler found grace, salvation, and being reinstated, he found life. To him, Joseph was a light that brought him life for no cause of merit that we know of according to scripture. Whereas, let's find out what happened to the baker. So right before we get to the baker, let's finish verses 14 and 15. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and shew kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. Verse 16. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Verse 18, And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Verse 21, And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so here, brothers and sisters, the baker was hanged. But as it was the case with the butler who was reinstated, the baker had committed an offense against the king of Egypt. And so there was no reason from scripture that we can look at and say that there was some type of righteousness in the butler that could not be found in the baker. That is to say, to come back to what we were saying in the beginning, that these two were sinners None of them was righteous before the king of Egypt. None of us is righteous before the Lord. And yet, some, when they come in contact with the light in the image of Joseph, some will be drawn in to be given eternal life. Some will be drawn in and will find remission for their sins and be reinstated unto life and get glorified bodies eventually. They are resurrected. They are taken out of prison spiritually rather than physically here. They're taken out of prison spiritually to have communion with the Lord and give drink to the master. Whereas there are others who yet having a glimpse of that light, it seems that they don't recognize it. They don't benefit from it in the image of the baker who also was in contact with Joseph. But the message that he received was not one that was able to produce life in him, the baker. And so I speak about this because we are talking about finding grace. The butler found grace, but not by any reason of an effort that he made, not for any cause related to him, but the fact that he found grace. And so it is a gift that he has received. There is no righteousness that he can put forth to claim that grace that he received. Because both had offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. And when they came in the presence of Joseph, who shed light upon their respective situations, it turns out that one was called unto eternal life and another wasn't. That's the image that we have here in the flesh. One was saved, another was not saved. 
Was it because one was more righteous than the other? We cannot assume that it is the case. Now, some of you may dispute that. Let me explain to you why I say that. Why we can't assume and say that the butler who was reinstated was more righteous than the baker who was hanged. We go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, verse 15. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Verse 21. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Verse 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. And so here, brothers and sisters, we notice many things. The first thing we notice is that when you rely on the judgment of men, men are able to declare guilty someone who is innocent. This was certainly the plan of the Lord that things would happen this way. But we are looking at spiritual images in order to grow and have instruction and education about the word. And so we realize that when men make decisions, they are not necessarily just. Here Jesus, Yehoshua, is sentenced to be killed by crucifixion. Whereas Barabbas, a man who was a known criminal, the people will request that he be set free. And in this, you see how the justice of man is filthy rags. We are in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Our judgments are wicked. They're not reliable. That's why the Lord is the just judge. We are unfair judges. This is akin to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, brothers and sisters, starting at verse 4. The unjust judge, and he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And so this judge did not fear God, and he exercised his own judgment, filthy rags, giving justice to the widow only because it suited his own interests, personal interests, rather than the interests of a greater justice. And so this is to confirm that our justice is filthy rags. Now, why did I talk about the unfair and unjust judge? Why did I talk about our justice being filthy rags? We have to go back now to the main train of thoughts, the Genesis chapter 40. We are at verse 20. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. 
but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. And so one is restored, another is hanged. This king of Egypt, Pharaoh, was a man, and his judgment cannot be assumed to have been righteous judgment, because maybe it is the case that he hanged the one who was righteous, just like the people chose to crucify Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who was righteous and who still is righteous. Whereas they wanted to spare Barabbas, the sinner, the murderer, the one who had committed crimes. And so here, because Pharaoh is a man, we have to be open to the possibility that he would have restored the one who was unrighteous and hanged the one that would have been quote unquote more righteous because we have indeed established that there is not one righteous save the Lord Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And therefore, brothers and sisters, this is why I'm talking about finding grace. Sometimes it happeneth to the righteous man as it happeneth to the wicked. We can read about this in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 14. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men, unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men, to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. And so you have people who are criminals who will be declared innocent by the courts of men, presided by unjust men sometimes. Whereas you can have men who are innocent and who will be declared guilty. We have these two examples here. We have the example of our Lord and Savior, Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, condemned to crucifixion, condemned by men, crucify him, where he is the only righteous one who did no sin, and conversely, Barabbas is spared and set free, being a criminal, with evidence to support it. And so the judgment of men is dangerous. It is filthy rags. And so getting back to our story in Genesis chapter 40, we cannot tell why the chief butler was reinstated and why the chief baker was hanged. We have no idea. And we have to be understanding this and not rather in our flesh assume that it is for cause of any righteousness that the chief butler would have demonstrated that he was restored. Amen? And this is a spiritual image to show you that unto some it is given to them that the Lord will draw them in. Because the Lord says, I have chosen you, you have not chosen me. Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. This is interesting, brothers and sisters, because it reminds us again that we have found grace. It reminds us that we are a chosen generation. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. A chosen generation. I have chosen you. A royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A chosen generation, I have chosen you. A royal priesthood. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests, royal priesthood unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and in Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 5, 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Being predestinated. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, For unto you, it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. On my channel, there is another Bible study titled, Unto You It Is Given. If you want more detail and if you want to expound on that notion of what is given us, you may listen to that Bible study. And so for the purpose of our conversation, we remember that we are a chosen generation. He hath chosen us, we have not chosen him. We remember that we are a royal priesthood, that we are kings and priests. We remember that he has taken us out of darkness and into his light, which correlates physically to being in a prison and taken out of it so that we can be reinstated because we were in a fallen state. Spiritually, we're taken out of death and separation from the Lord to communion with him in the light. And being in the light, where there is no darkness, we can be declared to be holy, an holy nation. Be ye holy, for I am holy. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, verse 44, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am I'm holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so the important part here is be ye holy, for I am holy. Sanctify yourselves so you can be that holy nation that we spoke of. That chosen generation of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, chosen of the Lord, a royal priesthood, that is kings and priests, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and an holy nation. Be ye holy, for I am holy, a peculiar people. That ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so now you're called to shine your light, and your light will not only come by way of the interpretation that you will be able to give, as Philip gave to the Ethiopian eunuch, as Paul was able to give after he had the revelation of the Son of God, as Daniel was able to interpret the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar, as Joseph was able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, and as Joseph was here able to bring interpretation to the dreams of both butlers, representatives of the world, and different categories of people in the world. And so not only in terms of the light that you bring, but the interpretation that you bring, the wisdom of the Lord that you bring and share with the nations, your works also will be works of light and you will be known by your fruit. We are in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. And so saints in the light will have fruit that is good. They will have good works. In fact, according to Titus chapter 2, verse 14, they will be zealous of good works. Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, restore us, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And they've been purified in holy nation, and you will know them by their fruit, zealous of good works. They abide in the truth, contrary to those who do evil. Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so the works of darkness, these works, they are rooted in a lie. They are not just. And so remember the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27. There is another point I would like to show you. Do you see how Pilate asked them twice what should be done with Jesus Christ, Yoshua HaMashiach? In verse 22, he asks, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. First attempt at reasoning them. First attempt at showing them light, spiritual image. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? Second attempt to show them light and justice. How do they react? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified the first time. Let him be crucified the second time. And then, verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. This is a powerful spiritual image right here, brothers and sisters. These people are asked twice about considering the light in the image of the gospel of Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and both times they declined. Here is the spiritual image I want to share with you. In the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 10, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Pilate asked them twice what to do and gave them twice an opportunity to do justly and they cried out the more, crucify him. First time, second time. It is the same thing with the gospel. This is a spiritual image. When you have preached and shown the light to a person, if they are an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject them. If they say, I do not believe, number one, I do not believe, number two, reject. And so Pilate applied that reasoning in asking the people twice and letting them deny Christ twice. And then he said, I wash my hands of the blood of these people. And they themselves then said, our blood is upon us, meaning our judgment, we own it. But you, Pilate, who preached to us twice, your hands are clean. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. And by rejecting him, you have washed your hands of this person's judgment before the Lord. And if they die this way, their blood is on their own hands. And this is a powerful spiritual image that we can draw from the interaction between Pilate and the people who wanted to crucify Christ, Mashiach. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, we also get further understanding about Titus 3.10 that we just read. Why is it that after the first and second admonition, you must reject? Because beyond that point, you have no more control. It is all up to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Do you see the three steps here? 
I have planted, first admonition. Apollos watered, second admonition. Then what happens is between the hands of the Lord. God will give the increase. And so beyond having planted and watered these two first steps, it is then up to God to decide whether the person is drawn in, whether to give the increase or not. This is another powerful spiritual image that we can observe. First and second admonition. You plant, you water, but the seed will not grow in the person's heart because the type of soil that it is receives not the word. Then you leave it in the hands of the Lord. He's the one who decides if there is an increase or not. And so, brothers and sisters, back in Genesis chapter 40, verse 21. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And so Pharaoh was able to receive the cup from the hand of the chief butler. This reminds us of Nehemiah, who was a cup bearer. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cup bearer. And he also was seeking mercy at the hand of King Artaxerxes. That's Nehemiah, hoping to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Another interesting spiritual image that we have, brothers and sisters, is that is that the chief butler gave drink to the king of Egypt, to Pharaoh. And we have again the spiritual analogy of how Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, asked certain people to give him drink. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, the Samaritan woman, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And so Jesus asked for someone to be his cup bearer. And he is looking in this world to see who it is who will be willing to give him to drink. And in return, he will give them living water. And so there are those who are called to give to the Lord to drink and to give him good drink. But there are people who will take that and unfortunately give the Lord something that is not pleasant to drink. Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, verse 34. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And you remember the Lord had said, I thirst. And that's what they gave him, vinegar. And so you have two categories of people. Those who will give the Lord a pleasant drink, and he will ask it from them, some water to drink. And you have some who will give him vinegar. Why do I speak about this? Because we are talking about the chief butler being reinstated as a cupbearer and being able to serve the king a drink. And so it is required by some that they will bring a drink to the king, and it should be the kind of drink that is pleasant and not vinegar. It should be good works and not wicked works. And this is a spiritual image that I'm conveying here. And so, brothers and sisters, we have seen that salvation is a gift. It is by grace. And all good things, all good gifts, and perfect gifts come from above and come down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That is James chapter 1, verse 17. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 6, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Verse 7, For who maketh thee to defer from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it. 
Remember how I explained that there is no evidence that the chief butler who was reinstated while the chief baker was hanged, there is no evidence in the Bible to confirm that he had more righteousness, the chief butler that is. And so what makes him different from the chief baker who was hanged? There is no difference that we can perceive based on the scriptures. And therefore, we would in our flesh naturally be tempted to assume that he had more righteousness than the chief baker, but that is not a fact. And so it brings us to the idea of grace and how some are chosen to be drawn in and some are not. Unto some it is given to have faith and to suffer for the Lord, and unto others it is not given them. God draws people to him and no one can come to him unless he does it. And he is dealing with a group of people, mankind, amongst whom there is none righteous, no, not one, whether they be Jews or Gentiles, or whether they be unsaved, the nations that are in darkness. And so the chief butler could ask himself, what do I have that the chief baker did not have? Why was I reinstated? Because we have read that sometimes it happens to the righteous in the way that it should happen to the wicked, and conversely, sometimes it happens to the wicked according to the way that it should happen to the righteous. And so therefore we come to realize that the chief butler simply found grace, the way that Noah found grace. It was by no work of his that he was reinstated, whereas the chief butler was hanged. Whereas in the case of Pilate, deciding to let Barabbas go and setting him free, and having Jesus crucified, that is the judgment of men. It can be marred by error, although we do understand that this was the plan of the Lord. But we're using here the context to make the point that men can make bad decisions. The people made bad decisions, although we understand it was the plan of the Lord. Likewise, the unrighteous judge in Luke chapter 18 finally rendered justice to the widow only for cause of his personal interests being satisfied. And so I say all this to show that everything you have, you have received. Make not your boast. And as saints, we must not come to a point where we look down on unbelievers or condemn them. We can point out the sin, but we cannot condemn them because it is not in our power to decide their faith. We preach the gospel once and twice. And if they are still an heretic, as the people were after Pilate asked them twice about Christ, then we wash our hands and their fate is in their hands and their blood is upon them. And so we plant and we water a seed. God gives the increase. And if we are saved, it is not by any work that we have done, but it is a gift. Salvation is a gift through faith. We are talking about grace and finding grace with the Lord. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Brothers and sisters, we have to learn to humble ourselves and again, have respect for unbelievers and do what we are told to preach the message to them, show them the light of the gospel and let God give the increase where he so sees fit. Understanding that we plant and we water and then if a man is an heretic, we have to wash our hands like Pilate and continue to go and to show the nations the proper interpretation of spiritual things using the wisdom of God that we have received because we have an anointing. And we can explain to the nations, just like Philip explained to the Ethiopian eunuch, that which they see but cannot perceive, that which they hear but cannot understand. Hallelujah. Because unto them it may not be given. And so we give glory to the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, because he has had compassion on us. He has had compassion on us 
who were blind, who spiritually were blind, who were in sin, and he hath laid his eyes on us. And seeing that we were blind, he gives us sight. Matthew chapter 20, verse 34. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. We follow the good shepherd who has come and had compassion on us. And so, brothers and sisters, as we conclude this Bible study and not glorifying ourselves and understanding that salvation is a gift through faith in the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and it is by grace. Amen. Genesis chapter 40, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. The nations have all sinned against the Lord, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether we look at it from the perspective of the saved and the unsaved, the seed of the Lord and the seed of the enemy, all of them come into this world, sinners, born from their mother's womb in iniquity. Verse two, and Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. Not one is righteous before God whatsoever group they belong to. Verse 3, And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. We saw the physical prison where Joseph was with the two butlers, but we understood that spiritually they were in different places. We understood that spiritually Joseph is a slave in prison, a prisoner, but of Christ, and that he is shedding light on the nations, and that the butlers are prisoners, but spiritually prisoners of darkness and sin, in bondage to sin, and that there is a great gulf between Joseph and the butlers, just like there was a great gulf between Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and the rich man in hell. This because Joseph is in the light. Joseph is in good standing with the Lord. But he has a responsibility now to shine that light upon the nations, to shine that light upon those who are in darkness and to serve them. Verse four, and the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and he served them and they continued a season in ward. And this, even if Joseph was bound in his own affliction, but it was working unto his good because he was going to be at the right hand of the king and because he was going to give them interpretation and show them his light, which is his duty. But as we're gonna see that light is not going to end up having the same end result concerning the fate of each man. Verse 5, And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. People in the world trapped in sin, in a prison, but we can set them free, or the Lord rather can set them free, by the preaching of the gospel. How will they hear without a preacher? Verse six, and Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them and behold, they were sad. And so he had compassion on them in the image of Christ having compassion upon the blind. And he executed his ministry and gave them the interpretation of things that they could not understand. Verse seven, and he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? He did not pass by the person in need. He did not look upon them to then be indifferent and pass the other way, but rather he looked upon their concern and was bearing the burden with them, having the mind of Christ. Verse 8, And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And so Joseph will be able to give the interpretation that stems from having the wisdom of God as a spiritual image, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that teaches all things and that allows God to instruct us and open our understanding. This is an interpretation that the world does not have, even though there are magicians because they do not know the God who reveals secrets. The same God who enlightened Joseph concerning the dreams of Pharaoh, Daniel concerning the dreaming of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 9, And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. 
and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head, and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand, after the former manner when thou wast his butler. He will be restored. He will be reconciled to his master. Verse 14. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and shew kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. You see, we have this sense of righteousness, even though we are unrighteous. Just like Job here, Joseph is labeling himself as someone who would be just, when we know that there is only one who is. We have all come short of the glory of the Lord. Verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so two individuals, the chief baker and the chief butler, committed an offense against God. Sinners have sinned against God. And yet, by the preaching of the gospel, some will be saved and some will not. Some are chosen and some are not. As well, we do not know the nature of the offense that was committed by each butler. But what we do know is that it is not possible to claim more righteousness for the chief butler who was reinstated, that he would have more righteousness than the chief baker who was hanged, because they were both unrighteous. And so this brings about the notion of grace and finding grace. And we cannot rely on the judgment of men to determine who was more righteous in this situation, because we have proof and evidence in the story of Pilate and Jesus that a guilty man can be set free and truly an innocent one who did no sin can be sentenced to death, even crucifixion. And so the judgment of man is filthy rags. And so we rely on God. And so we ought not to glorify ourselves and boast for gifts that we have received. And we must recognize that we have received them. And it is not by any works that we have done. Brothers and sisters, this is about finding grace and not exalting ourselves above measure and being humble before the Lord and repenting the way that Nehemiah and Ezra repented before the Almighty, keeping the word close to us like the psalmist so that we do not sin against Lord God Almighty. And we are thankful that he has saved us by grace through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May you be blessed in his mighty name, his excellent name. Hallelujah. Amen.